Good afternoon. This is the continuation of the House Appropriations Committee meeting. We are gathered on uh, April 27th in the afternoon. We are gathered here now to con uh, continue discussion uh, around housing and in particular um, our emergency housing program. Folks will recall that when we had possession of the budget, we um, clearly knew, as everybody clearly knew, that we have an enormous challenge facing us with regard to the monumental effort that um, the state has been engaged in, in terms of housing uh, folks who do not have homes during the pandemic and the equally monumental challenge of what do we do um, to properly support Vermonters as we move out of the pandemic. We did not have any brilliant ideas about what to do. So said in the version of the budget that we had to the Agency of Human Services, would you please convene a work group to um, put smart people who understand these programs together to come up with a, a proposal for how we should move forward? And um, we are joined by some of those smart people today. And I, I want to acknowledge um, the really hard work that folks have done um, it, this really is a challenging program and people care passionately about getting it right. And, and that, that is everybody who has been sitting at the table, as well as those of us on this committee and others who've been watching your work. I know it's been hard and um, really, um, it, 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 so thank you. Um, so we're joined here um, by um, by Commissioner Brown, um, uh, uh, Mr. Peppinger from who support who's senior advisor to DCF, uh, Miss. Truckle, who's the financial director for DCF, and Ms. Radboard, who is um, staff attorney at Vermont Legal Aid. And I believe all of you folks were part of that, um, of the effort that I've just tried to describe. Uh, we do not have anyone scheduled after you. Um, we know that the Senate is considering uh, inserting language in the budget associated with this work. And so we need to understand what you're proposing. And, and um, I don't know if we will get to it today, but we will also want to understand language that is likely to be proposed that we're likely to see when the budget comes back from the Senate. So with that as a long-winded uh, introduction, Commissioner Brown, let me turn this over to you. Sure, um, uh, thank you. Um, as you indicated, um, you know, this work group convened um, in accordance with the language that was in the budget passed uh, by the House. Um, that working group uh, was led by Secretary Mike Smith um, and Deputy Secretary Jenny Samuelson. Um, also with the staff um, uh, that you mentioned that are here today from the administration and also Sarah Phillips um, from the administration played a key role as well. And then Jeffrey, I think it's important to acknowledge all of the other community partners who participated on the work group and, um, and other members from the administration. And Jeffrey's just gonna kind of walk us through that list just to give the committee a sense of, of, of the, the breadth and, and geographic, just, you know, uh, uh, representation we had on that work group. Thank you, Sean. For the record, my name is Jeffrey Pippinger. I'm the senior advisor to the commissioner for the Department for Children and Families. Um, a big thank you to our community partners who um, uh, joined us in trying to uh, determine a path forward uh, in that GA working group. And those were, there was representation from Vermont Legal Aid, uh, Chittenden County Homeless Alliance, the Vermont Coalition to End Homelessness, uh, the Community Action Partnership, and the Network Against Domestic and Sexual Violence. 
Uh, more specifically, Tom Donahue from Brock participated, uh, along with Paul Dragon from the Champlain Valley Office of Economic Opportunity, Kara Casey from the Network uh, Against Domestic and Sexual Violence, uh, Michael Redman from the Upper Valley Haven, uh, Rita Markley from COTS, Josh Davis from the Groundworks Collaborative in Brattleboro, uh, and Jessica Rabord from Vermont Legal Aid, who is kind enough to join us here today. And that group, group really dove in and tackled some really challenging issues. Um, and we just thank them for their participation and collaboration. And um, that group did meet, um, I think, for a, a series of eight meetings during the month of April for several hours at a time um, to meet and to try to envision um, what the emergency housing program would look like um, to develop this plan for state fiscal year 22. Um, uh, as we walk through this plan, you know, there was um, uh, uniform agreement um, in most areas of the plan where there wasn't, we've noted it. And that, in one of the areas, um, you will see that um, um, in the plan where Jessica has noted and, and uh, Paul Dragon from CVOEO um, noted some concerns and Jessica can elaborate on their thinking on that, but we do appreciate um, that for the most part, there was unanimous consensus on this plan moving forward, except for that one area that we'll highlight for the committee, just so that you'll understand um, that one area. Um, you know, uh, so when we were approaching this, uh, one of the areas that we looked at, you know, there's the funding piece that we've always historically had a resource limitation for the general assistance program, which over time led to some very restrictive eligibility categories, um, um, but also what's been a limiting factor in the past has been the availability of motel rooms. Um, Pre-pandemic, um, during the winter, we regularly would run out of motel rooms um, when we were needing motel rooms between 250 to 300 rooms a night across the state, and uh, many times we would run out uh, with the pandemic and the tourist industry shutting down, um, we were able to utilize um, those motels who were no longer serving tourists and travelers to meet the need to whereas right now we're almost utilizing 2000 motel rooms across the state. Um, we know from our work with those motels and continually trying to recruit um, new motels into the program because we, we are still running into some ca capacity issues right now in certain areas of the state. Um, and not meeting the full need, just given we have no more motel capacity of where we are now, that motels have told us they're gonna start shifting as the economy opens up and start serving the tourist and traveling industry again. Um, and we predict already between 250 and 350 motel rooms in the next couple months. And then we will see, um, we predict based on our conversations, a steady decline um, into the winter where we're projecting now based on those conversations that we'll have about 650 motel rooms available um, on any given night um, for the emergency housing program, which is substantially more than we've had historically, but significantly less than what we have available now across the state. And so with, with those resource constraints informing the conversation, um, we really look to how do we um, take into you know, the money the house set aside in this budget and the motel rooms and how do we envision the program um, moving forward in 22? And so the, the first piece that we're proposing would be instituting new eligibility criteria on June 1st for new households coming into the program. Um, and these categories will look somewhat similar to the historical categories. Uh, and in some ways they'll be new or expanded and also how, how the length of time we house people will look different as well. Um, and so I'll walk the committee um, through these new eligibility criteria that we're proposing for June 1st. Um, as we had with the historical catastrophic, we still would be serving um, households who lost their housing due to natural disaster, um, such as flood or a hurricane or a fire um, or some other catastrophic event. Um, also, um, at historically, we've served um, those who have lost their housing fleeing domestic violence, dating violence, sexual violence, stalking, human traffic, or, or some other dangerous or life-threatening um, 
um, violence against a member that's caused them to flee their permanent housing um, or housing, um, that category would remain. Um, also, um, we're proposing um, to continue to serve families with children. Historically, um, if you had a family with a child under six, you were eligible for 28 days. Um, and if you had a child over six, you were not eligible. We're proposing an expansion of this category um, and that we will serve families with children of any age up to age 19 if they're still in secondary school. Um, all, and also what I would say is all of these categories that we'll mention today are, will be eligible for 84 days in a 12, in a, in a 12 month period. Historically, catastrophic were eligible for 84 days and the vulnerable categories were eligible for 28. Uh, we're basically saying these new categories are all eligible for 84 days with a couple of exceptions, which we'll walk the committee through. And one of those first exceptions are families with kids after their 84 days, if they've not been able to secure permanent housing, they will be able to ask for a 30 day extension um, if they are still engaged with services and case management and housing searches, that they will be able to continue to ask for 30 day extensions if there are a family with children. Um, so that, that is something, a significant shift from the prior um, uh, program uh, pre-pandemic. So we're expanding the families to all, all families with kids and also um, more than 28 days, 84 days, with, with 30 day extensions, as long as they're continuing to co to um, work towards their permanent housing goals. Um, we recognize um, that it's harder to house families with children just because they need larger housing or apartments. And those are even more scarce than smaller apartments. And so it's taking them longer to find permanent housing. And this recognizes um, those, those uh, permanent housing limitations that they're facing in the market. Um, also, um, we're con um, continuing the category of housing households with uh, older Vermonters age 60 or above. Um, historically, those were eligible for 28 days. Here, they will be eligible for 84 days. So that, that's an expansion up in that category as well. Um, also, um, we're continuing um, the category of uh, households with an individual with a disability, whether um, um, that um, is through uh, demonstrated through the receipt of, of SSI, SSDI, or VA disabilities, or some through S, through um, some other means. Um, again, that historically was a 28-day uh, benefit period for this category pre-pandemic. We are now um, uh, uh, saying that will be eligible for up to 84 days, and this is a category where we're going to be putting in. Um, uh, uh, that, that they can apply for a, an extension through the, through the um, Economic Services Division if it's a household uh, with a disability who has a significant limitations in their act, uh, activities of daily living, their ADLs. And at that point, we would start working with um, our partners or hopefully beforehand with our partners at uh, disabilities, aging and independent living um, um, and community partners to see if um, we need to start connecting them to some other type of care or residential care in the state to meet their needs. Um, we do know during the pandemic that many congregate settings, of community care homes, lower level community care homes um, and other type of programs shut down. And our hope is as, as we open back up that we'll be able to rec um, um, re-engage some of um, folks who are housing back into those um, uh, living situations, but um, we, we're going to need to identify those households. And also, if we're not able to, we'll have the ability to extend their housing beyond 84 days um, if they have significant limitations in their ADLs. Um, also, um, we will continue to uh, serve um, households that include um, a, a, pregnant, a pregnant woman. Um, historically, that's been limited to someone who is in their third trimester of pregnancy. Um, we are now expanding that category here to any trimester. And again, it will be an expansion beyond 28 days to 84 days. Um, uh, that, that used to be a, no, a vulnerable category of limited to 28. We're now expanding that to 84 days in this proposal. Um, and then also we will continue to house um, uh, households that are facing certain 
um, evictions or loss of their housing, a rental housing. Um, one would be uh, those who have lost it due to the pursuit of, um, you know, uh, trying to rectify violations of the rental housing health code, where that the apartment that they housing they were renting was not up to code and was creating a hazard health hazard. And if they lose housing as a result of that um, work, they would be eligible for 84 days. Um, and then also um, those that were physically barred entry um, into their uh, living and re uh, rental unit through the intentional act of the landlord. And we do see that and Jessica can, in her work see, can, can explain how that might look, but those households will be, would be eligible for up to 84 days as well. Um, so those would be the new eligibility categories for new applicants coming into the system on June 1st and moving forward. Commissioner, why don't I, I don't see any hands, but let me just take a pause here. That's, this is a natural breaking point. Uh, Representative Feltis. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> so I understand people who are currently being served, your current households, they will stay as they are until June 30th. But then on, and on July 1, those persons can apply for these new criteria? Will they be considered new households then at that point? Yes, at that point they would, um, as you indicated, we would continue to house everyone that's in the program now um, up until June 1st and then um, through June 30th. And then they would be eligible to reapply. And if they met these new eligibility categories, they would be eligible um, for the number of days for the category they fit into here, whether it's 84 days or if they're a family with kids, they, they could be extended. Um, and so we anticipate based on our analysis of the household we're serving that two thirds of the households that we're housing now will be eligible under these new criteria. And so that's just about okay. 2,000, between 1,900 and 2,000 households. I don't have the exact number right in front of me, but we do have that uh, as of this morning. So you anticipate you. that following the application of this criteria, there are about 1,900 to 2,000 households who would fall into the new category. Uh, th that's the total cohort of who we're housing now. We're anticipating about 1,300 of those, 12 to 1,300 of those households will meet the new eligibility criteria and be eligible for 84 more days of housing. Okay, so um, we in the past have heard numbers on the order of 25 to 2,700 people being housed. So people as of today, we are, we're seeing again about 2,000 folks and about 60 odd percent of those 2,000 would are likely to fit in this new criteria. Understand? So, I, I, yeah, I'll, I'll clarify. Thank you. Um, so when I'm using the term households, I, I look at the number of rooms we're renting. Um, and so as of this morning, um, we're renting approximately 1,900 and 38 motel rooms. And that that is serving approximately 2,000 um, and th just under 2,300 adults and about 1,413 kids. 2,300 adults and plus 1,300 kids? Uh, 23, just under 2,300 adults and 413 kids. Oh. 413 kids. So in fact, we are on the order of serving 2,700 people. Correct, correct, people. But in terms of household, it's a, it's like it. 1,900. Okay, thank you. Sure. Um, Representative Iacovoni? Yes, thank you. Um, uh, Sean, this is great work. And it's uh, light years ahead in terms of what we, the state used to. Uh, provide the vast uh, improvement. Um, so, what 
do you expect will happen to the some the 40% of the people that won't be eligible for the new uh, eligibility? Yes, so this plan includes um, ongoing funding for support services, housing case management services, but it also includes um, a, a, a sum of money to help folks transition out of motels and reestablish um, housing um, situations that look could look very different depending on uh, you know the, the specifics of their own um, situation. Um, so we're proposing a um, million dollars of CRF funding that we still have available. That was for our earlier housing plan that we were appropriated about 16 million. And so we would use um, a million of that for a rapid resolution. So that could help pay for a variety of expenses to help someone transition to another living situation. We're also proposing um, a $3 million um, uh, fund that um, we're calling essential payments. Um, and that would also uh, be CRF funds as well. And that would be a payment that we would pay to each individual as they transitioned out um, to help establish themselves. We know that many of the individuals, particularly single adult households, which will make up able body single adult households, which will be the bulk of the 40% that will be impacted when this transition occurs, we're staying with family and friends. And so if we're able to provide some financial support to help them reestablish and connect and, and provide some financial support to re-engage in those living situations, uh, th that's what those funds are helped to do. Also, we know that some of the individuals transitioned in from other systems of care that shut down during the pandemic, like sober houses or other treatment programs. And our goal is, is as we reopen and health and safety guidelines allow them to reopen safely, that for those that need to re-engage with that, we will help them transition back to those services as well. Um, also, you know, we're, we're housing some individuals that might need to go to a higher level um, of, uh, of community care type uh, settings. Um, you know, we had a lot of folks in community care, uh, you know, informal settings um, that due to the virus ended up in our, in, in our program. And we've been working with the Vermont Chronic Care Initiative and their nurses and the Department of Aging, Disabilities, Aging and Independent Living to make sure we're connecting people to the right, to the right living situation and services. And that work will continue. Um, some people will transition back to shelters. We believe 150 shelter beds will come back online. And the governor's um, housing proposal, the $249 million housing plan, makes some um, immediate investments in expanding shelter capacity in the state. Um, we believe that would immediately, could create very quickly about 150 new beds. Also, um, there's an anticipation that we would bring 600 new units online um, uh, with, you know, within um, early in the year as well with that. And then more would come online in the outer years. We know from our work during the pandemic with the uh, BHCB funding uh, provided with the CRF funds by the legislature that many um, programs in the state were able to purchase other uh, settings and quickly open them up as permanent housing like motels and other buildings. And our hope is, is that happens as well. Um, and that work is ongoing right now too. And so it, it could look different, um, but I wanna uh, you know, be clear and Jessica can, can weigh in here as well is there will be people that we are not successful housing. And that is the hope that if we provide funding that they might be able to either uh, you know, pay for their own housing in a motel or in a campground or some other setting. Um, and I will point out that this plan contemplates us uh, again, um, having an adverse weather policy similar to years past. So when the weather conditions meet criteria, the rules are relaxed and anyone who's homeless during the winter, um, during cold weather has a safe place to go as well. And we anticipate um, at, at running that this year as well. That's a part of this plan. Um, thank you. Uh, Rep Harrison, I see your hand, but Mr. Pippinger raised his hand. So I, I'm guessing he's clear. He, he has additional comments. Rep, uh, Mr. Thank, you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, if I can just add on to what the commissioner was saying, I think another way to uh, another way to look at this is also that 
uh, motels are not the destination that we want people residing in, right? So as we are housing people uh, in motels, and that's emergency housing, right? The purpose of that is to ensure short-term housing for vulnerable populations experiencing homelessness and housing insecurity. So as we're housing folks, we should be working to get them to a different positive exit when, when and wherever possible. But that may be a permanent housing situation. It may be being able to resolve back to family or friends, or maybe a home share or a room share. And that, especially as we see the number of motel rooms decrease over time and, our, and that capacity is limited, we need to be focused on um, getting people into other settings uh, as safely and stably as possible. Representative Harrison. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Commissioner, thank you um, again for meeting with the Rutland delegation this morning. Um, going through some of the criteria changes uh, a second time, I'm actually starting to get it a little bit. So sometimes, uh, as my committee mates will uh, attest, it, 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 my brain works a little slow sometimes. But um, I, I, I'm, I'm looking at a couple things. Um, you mentioned you expect, uh, when all is said and done this summer, that about a third of those that are currently on the program won't meet the eligibility. Um, two of the uh, higher profile motels in Rutland, you gave us some numbers. I thought it was a much more dramatic reduction uh, for those two motels, but maybe there are some other factors at play. You are correct. What, you know, and that was just analyzing those two hotels and, and just the way sometimes we house families and individuals could impact that. But you are correct. When I gave you numbers this morning, it was analyzing these criteria to who we're housing in those. And there, it was a greater number, but if we looked at some of the other hotels, which we'll do as we discussed, it could be less because that might be where we're housing more families with kids who would still be, because we have very few families with kids in some of the motels we discussed this morning. And so that could impact the numbers the other way for some of the other motels in your community. Okay, yeah, I, I, I guess I leaped to a con um, conclusion that maybe they were typical and I guess they're not. Um, one of our Rutland colleagues had asked about out-of-state guests. You didn't think it was a big part of those in the motel program, um, but you were prohibited from uh, court rulings to uh, discriminate one way or another if someone came in from out-of-state. Uh, my question is more, uh, and I appreciate you know, the, the hard work that I'm sure went into coming up with this plan with all the interested stakeholders. Um, I, I'm sure uh, it wasn't an easy conversation because everybody's coming at it from a little different uh, vantage point. But I'm curious as to how this program going forward compares with our neighboring states. Is it less generous than what you might find in other northern new england new york uh uh states or is it more generous um yeah i just didn't know if there's any standards out there that most states strive to so i would certainly look to others you know from our team presenting today to weigh in here as well but i i, I know like new hampshire does not have a, a a program similar to what vermont runs here um and other states i think use more of a shelter-based system as well but i would defer to my colleagues here as well as to see if they have more information. But I know we're one of few states um, in the nation that runs a program of, of, this, of this type um, that uses motels primarily as a source. I know California instituted something similar during the pandemic and some other states did too, but that wasn't something I think they used as a model pre-pandemic as Vermont has and Vermont will continue to do in 22. Jeffrey or, or Jessica, I know Jessica, you have some experience from some of your other work in this area as well. Um, yeah, so in uh, Massachusetts, there's a right to shelter for families with children. 
Um, I know in New York City, I, I used to work in a homeless shelter there, um, and there's a right to shelter for everyone in New York City. I think, don't quote me on this, for families statewide in New York? I'm not 100 sure on that. Um, in DC, there's also a right to shelter uh, for families and for everyone once the temperature goes below, I think, 32 degrees. And just last week, there was a decision in a court case in Los Angeles County that seems to give everyone a right to shelter within uh, six months, 12 months. Um, it's 110 pages long and I confess I haven't read the whole thing yet. And I may be missing a few areas, uh, but those are the big ones that I know it's framed as an entitlement program, as a right. Um, thank you. Uh, Commissioner, uh, we're, we're gonna have a hard time getting through this, sure. but I have a question too. Um, you, you, th this new policy goes into effect June 1st. Uh, are you assuming that the state of emergency, what is th this proposal's relationship to the state of emergency? And if we're still under a state of emergency, what is the consequence to this proposal, if any? So this proposal does somewhat track the, you know, the, the framework the governor laid out um, uh, several weeks ago in terms of the reopening. Um, and I know today that was discussed at the press conference that we've met the criteria for the next phase and with the anticipation that at the end of June that there would be a significant lifting of the state of emergency in some way, shape or form. And so this really tra tracks with that, with us going to new eligibility criteria on June 1st. And then um, at the end of, um, end of June for everyone else in terms of applying. Um, obviously, um, you know, our commitment here when we were working with the work group is that this is the plan for 22 and that um, as we've adjusted during the pandemic and, and implemented and promulgated some new emergency rules to address situations on the ground, that this would be our set plan for all of 22, ex with the exception that uh, we recognize uh, that the pandemic is not going away. And, and if we need to um, respond to uh, change circumstances in terms of the pandemic, that we would retain the flexibility um, to respond in an emergency to increase um, eligibility or services, but we wouldn't constrict it any further in 22, that this would be um, the program we would run unless we have to respond to a, to a further public health emergency in the pandemic. Okay. So this is assuming that we're going to see the continual uh, reopening of Vermont, but if if we had to go back into a lockdown where you know, uh, congregate housing is once again uh, problematic, then we rethink where we are. Correct, that, correct. Okay, well, okay. And uh, you, you've done a very nice job of outlining who is covered. Could you paint a picture of who is not covered by this, these new standards? Um, I, I, I kind of alluded to it in, a, in an earlier answer where it, it able-bodied single adult adults are, are not, will not be most likely eligible moving forward uh, under these proposals, unless okay. they meet some of the eviction criteria. Okay. And of that number, so and evidently about 30 to 40 percent of the current population you are housing falls into that category. In my roughly, opinion. yes, yes. Okay, yeah. great. Thank you. Yeah. So let um, Ms. Radford. Um, I just wanted to add something on that. Another category that's uh, excluded, and this is the one where CBOEO and legal aid raise some concerns. Um, so starting on June 1, uh, for new applicants, um, we're going, the proposal includes a return to a rule that says that if a household caused their own loss of housing or voluntarily left housing, that they're not able to access the GA program for a period of 90 days. So I always think of the example, 
of a mom who gets evicted for smoking in her non-smoking apartment. And under that rule, um, she would be denied the GA program benefits. And so um, she could end up on the street. And that seems like very punitive for that sort of thing, especially for her kids who did absolutely nothing wrong. So I think that you're, you're moving us to the next section of what we were moving through here. Uh, so Commissioner, I think we interrupted you with our, I interrupted you um, when you were getting ready to talk about income limits, self-pay. Yes, yeah, and, and I think we do wanna focus on kind of the, the we will get to the area that uh, yeah. Jessica just touched on as well. Um, yeah. So historically, there, you know, the income limits in, in um, the GA program were more closely aligned with the reach up um, um, program limits, and that was around 60% of the FPL. So it was, um, you, you needed to be really, really low income to meet the, the income threshold. We are now aligning moving forward the income threshold um, for this program in line with the, the lie heap and the three squares program at 185% of the FPL. Um, and then also um, we'll be requiring reinstituting a requirement um, that if it, households have income, um, just as they would normally, um, whether they had a, a, a rental assistance voucher or, or, or were paying rent, we are gonna ask that households with income contribute 30% of their income. Historically, that was gross. Now we're saying let's move to net. And then we're also going to um, you know, look at the calculation of what available income they have left um, after you know, we do the 30%. And if it equals less than two motel room nights a month, we're going to exclude it as, as, as income and let them keep that, given that's a pretty small amount of income. It'd be like $160. Um, you know, the average motel room is in, it, you know, was it around $88? It has crept up a little bit recently with hotels raising their rates. I think we're around $97 a night right now on average across the state. Um, but we will be reinstituting so that some households will be asked to contribute to the cost of their housing under this proposal. Could, could you, I, I, I'm sorry, it, it would help me understand this maybe if you gave an example example. Um, so say we're housing someone who's homeless, who's working, and they're earning 175% um, of the FPL. So they're eligible, um, they meet one of the categories, um, and they have, an, and I don't know the exact income limits in my head, but say we, we do the calculation and they have 30% uh, of their income, net income is $400 we would ask them to contribute that $400 a month towards the cost of their stay in a motel. And, and what goes into the calculation of their net income? Um, it, we would be taking off um, exp um, expenses like we do in some of our other program calculations. When we calculate their benefit, we give them credits for certain expenses and others. It, it, so there's a calculation that we would do. Uh, and I can imagine that's complicated. Yes. But, so, but could tell me what some of the things are that go into that calculation, or maybe you could subsequently provide us. We could provide you that list, but just as an example, you know, um, um, we're housing a large number of older Vermonters and Vermonters um, with a disability, and they have tend to have higher. Uh, medical expenses, ongoing medical or out-of-pocket expenses, and we allow those to, those type of deductions to come off your income. They might need to, to, to pay for certain medical expenses out-of-pocket that they pick up at a pharmacy on a regular basis, and so we allow them um, credits um, off their income for that type of expense. They may have a service animal, and we allow them to, to deduct the care and cost of their service animal as well you know, many of the folks that we're serving might have a, a, a service animal. And so those are the type of expenses that we would deduct off um, their, their gross income to get to the net income. Okay. Um, SNAP benefits or, well, SNAP. Those would not count as income. That would not count as income. Okay. Yeah. I would, it would be interesting to see yeah, this sure. little sheet of 
Yeah, thank you. Uh, Representative Jessup? Yeah, I'm just curious, how does child support figure in? I will have to get back. I'm not an expert. I used to work in the child support program many lifetimes ago, but I would need to, um, uh, we'll need to get back to you on that because I don't know the specific answer to that question, Representative Jessup, but we can get that for you. I, I believe Jessica does. Okay. <laughs> that, that was the sort of impetus between me, uh, you know, pushing for a net income because I've had some cases where child support was a big issue and it's my understanding that it is deducted. Child support payments, sorry. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I, just so then, FYI, uh, we may be, uh, we will be losing Ms. Truckle at 3.30. Um, thank you for sitting with us. I, we haven't even gotten to the money pieces mm -hmm. of this. Um, and so if people can think of money questions before she has to leave us or we can always come back to you later or email you our questions. But thank you for being here, Ms. Struckle. Uh, Rep. Jessup? Yeah, I, I could just pop out a few uh, questions that relate to money and if we get to them, we get to them. And if not, um, because it may just help other people think too. So um, I'm looking at the chart and I'm thinking that the numbers that are here are based on implementation of the governor's housing proposal too. I'm trying to understand the assumptions about numbers that are moving out or is it not fair to link the two? And then the other question I have is on uh, the box that refers back to the base budget. I was looking over at B325 for the uh, Gov's recommend. And, you know, that's a, a, if I add together some of the numbers that would have been backed out, and I know you've helped me with this a number of times, uh, it's a roughly 6.2 million. So is that a fair number to put in that box? And it is, I just have to say, that is really quite a difference, isn't it? <laughs> Compared to this chart we're looking at here. Um, Right. Yes, and I would let Sarah jump in here, but you are correct that um, while they're not, uh, we're not relying on funding um, of the governor's proposal specifically in this plan, um, but they are connected that we are relying on that plan to, to build out some additional shelter capacity and some new units, but that's not accounted for in, in these numbers here in the chart, but I could um, have Sarah walk you through that, that I think as you identified, we are proposing the emergency housing budget that's normally GF be moved over to OEO to continue to fund some of the uh, programs that are funded and supported by the housing opportunity program. If not, we will run into a supplanting issue and I would let Sarah Truckle uh, elaborate on that a little bit. That's correct. So Representative Jessup, the pieces we backed out of would need to go back to the GovRec where the 4 million moves to OEO and the 1.6 moves to OEO and those components uh, as proposed in the FY22 budget. And that ensures that we don't have a general fund budget within the emergency housing um, program so that that way we are using the uh, federal funds, the ERAP funds to fund this program next year. And we're gonna use our base budget to fund the uh, expanded community-based shelter and temporary and permanent uh, shelter capacity within the state. Okay, so the reason I'm also thinking about this, uh, you know, uh, let's say that um, the shelter capacity, we have an expectation that that will be 150 beds if I'm not mistaken. And let's say that comes in at some other number between then, we would have to um, account for that in this chart, right? Because these numbers are based on those assumptions in terms of our, our split, right? Because we have a declining number of hotel rooms. And again, I fully appreciate all the pressures and I commend, I'm just, since I'm watching the clock, I just wanted to get in the money issues. Um, so let's say, you know, the shelters come in at uh, 100 rather than 150. Let's say the planned housing units of 600 come in at 400. What are the implications then for, 
for these costs? And would that be, I know it's really hard to predict, but would that be something we'd be revisiting at budget adjustment? So we built the caseload projections for the ERAP program based on kind of two components. One was the current caseload and who we, we anticipate being eligible under the new eligibility programs, as well as the data that we have around adverse weather conditions and the number of nights that households typically are in during adverse weather conditions. And then we also crossed it against an anticipated motel capacity. So um, while we always have adjusted this budget and budget adjustment um, based on caseload, there is the issue this year of motel capacity and the 650 motel rooms that we are anticipating going into the, I guess, uh, winter season with is, uh, and Commissioner Brown can elaborate, but double the current capacity that we've historically operated under. So I think what you'll see from this budget is that uh, even in the event of those circumstances, we're still gonna be up against that capacity of just how many rooms are available. Um, and we really factored that into our analysis as well. I'm not trying to belabor that, but, but so I totally get the point we can't manufacture hotel rooms, but but those cost pressures, anyway, I'm, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Yeah, thank you. If, if I may add on to what uh, Sarah Drupal was saying, I think it, as I hear your question, Representative Jessup, it has to do with the governor's housing proposal and those fund, funds and where and how they might align with what we have in front of us in terms of the GA work group, right? There were two, two work groups that came out of the legislation that you worked on. One was on GA and one was on housing. And I think it's important to keep in mind that even though the projections as Sarah explained them are based on our own caseload and our understanding of eligibility and going forward based on the conversations we've had with the work group, et cetera, I think it's really critical for folks to understand that if we do not have places to put people, to transition people into permanent housing or expanded shelter capacity, that's a that that is that's going to be a problem, right? That doesn't have, necessarily have to do with the eligibility projections, because we're still going to have 84 days, right? We're changing we're changing the criteria back to a time limited and narrower scope of who might be eligible for emergency housing. Throughout the pandemic, we have worked very closely with our colleagues over at ACCD and our community partners in both housing and services. Uh, to, to try and come up with a coordinated coordinated approach here. And I think that that's, that's part of the very real landscape that we're finding ourselves in in this moment. Just adding on to that, um, as the community providers, when we got together, we sort of built a map for what new housing do we think is gonna be at the end of the road for people? Because as much as people appreciate having their GA motel room, they really wanna get into an apartment. And so when we were building that, we were you know, looking at how many people do we think are gonna be left with nothing? We were sort of banking on getting those extra 150 to 200 motel rooms. And I did see that on the Senate side, it looks like $12 million was approved to build that new shelter space. We were also banking on getting those 600 new units, which um, as Jeffrey knows, because I sent him a rather panicked email this morning, quite find in the uh, Senate appropriations language, it looks like the $90 million specifically for permanent housing for people experiencing homelessness wasn't, wasn't in there. Um, and someone please correct me if I, if I was wrong on that. Uh, and so when we're looking at how many people are gonna be left with literally nothing, because there are gonna be people who end up just getting a cash payment so that they can buy a tent and, and a sleeping bag. If we add 600 to the number that we were already anticipating, this is a really hard thing to take. Yeah, um, I, I think this is part of what we're trying to get our minds around. We, we haven't had the opportunity that you all have had for the past, I'm not sure it's an opportunity or the challenge that you guys have had. So. Thank you. Um, Commissioner, take us back to where we where we interrupted uh, so, you. And yep. My guess is we're going to ask you all back, um, particularly as we get down into the money. So we'll, sure. Sorry, Sarah, but there's more time with us. 
yeah we're, we're happy to to come back and, and dive deeper into the finances yeah. behind it for sure um the next piece um that we focused on was the period of ineligibility so historically um if someone was asked to leave a motel due to behavior of, of it could be a very small infraction or a larger infraction there was a period of inelig ineligibility imposed um, during the pandemic um, we shortened and, and modified that period of ineligibility and um, just understanding it was a public health response but also felt like we needed some mechanism to, to you know given some of the behaviors we were seeing in the motels um, and we're kind of building upon that work of how we modified it in the pandemic um, and further refining it here, where we're um, still saying there'll be a um, period of ineligibility for the majority of the households. However, um, we're exempting uh, uh, children from that period of ineligibility. So we don't wanna harm kids. And so families with kids who are being housed won't be um, serving a period of ineligibility. If they've asked to leave a motel, we will move them to another motel in that community if we're able to. Um, but for all other individuals who um, uh, there will be a period of ineligibility if it falls into the new categories that we're creating here. So we, we're breaking it up now into major violations and minor violations. And minor violations, um, we won't impose um, a period of ineligibility. Um, that would be if someone's just being loud or disruptive. Um, if they um, were using uh, illegal substances, um, smoking in a non-designated room, um, cigarettes or marijuana, uh, minor theft um, or unintentional um, damages to room. One of the issues we're seeing during the pandemic are that we're housing some individuals with some hoarding tendencies. Um, and so, and the cleanliness of their room is becoming an issue. We're working with motels to, to kind of support guests struggling with that. Um, and so for those folks, you know, we're not going to impose a period of ineligibility, but if they're asked to leave, we will move them. Um, we will then, for major violations, um, be imposing a period of ineligibility. So if, if they're asked to leave for one of these categories, um, initially they would in, be ineligible to be housed for 15 days. Then after that period, they could come back into the program if they still um, were homeless. Um, and then for each subsequent offense, it would be a 30-day period of ineligibility. And those would be violent criminal behavior. Um, if they attempted to, to uh, some violent criminal behavior, a major theft from the hotel or a guest, um, creating a safety hazard, um, particularly concerning for us. Uh, we've seen some guests disabling smoke detectors um, in, in, in rooms and in, in the hotel, um, and that creates a real fire hazard. And so we've asked you know, like the fire marshal, you uh, the state fire marshal to increase inspections just because of our concern here. Um, uh, also uh, threatening um, uh, other guests or motels uh, guests on the sale or distribution of legal substances or the intentional destruction of property. And so this, this, these, this is a new way of us moving forward with the period of ineligibility from um, from what it was pre-pandemic to what it was during the pandemic, now it's 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 being um, refined and modified even further moving forward under this uh, plan, as I described. Um, as Jessica indicated, one of the areas where there was not unanimous agreement was historically um, pre-pandemic. If someone caused their own homelessness or left permanent housing voluntarily, they were ineligible to be housed for up to a six-month period. Um, during the pandemic, um, we waived that requirement because it was a public health response. Um, we are now going to be moving forward with this um, uh, condition again, um, but we agreed um, uh, almost unanimously, except for two members of the committee, um, to, to lower that to three months. And I think I would let Jessica jump in here. Um, this is where we did not have unanimous agreement, where Jessica Radboard and Paul Dragon felt like even a three month period of ineligibility was too long. And I think she's touched on, on that a little bit, but I think she'd like to elaborate a little more. 
Yeah, I, I mean, it's pretty much what I said before, right? It's uh, 90 days is a really long time for someone to be left without housing. Um, I'm hoping that on the voluntarily leaving housing, uh, we'll find some flexibility from the department um, because what we see a lot of the times is people are a little bit confused about what their rights are. And so they think because their landlord said, I'm trying to sell the property, you really need to go, that they need to go and they think maybe I can go stay with a family member. That often doesn't pan out so well. Um, and But aside from that, right, there are gonna be eviction cases that we just can't win. Uh, and I, I think leaving people with nothing for 90 days, especially if they fall in one of those vulnerable categories, it's gonna be eligible, seems overly punitive. And, it, you know, as, and I fully confess that I have a tender place in my heart for those cases involving kids where the kid didn't do anything wrong. And so leaving them in a car for 90 days because the parent broke a, a, a rule in the place where they've been living seems pretty harsh. Thank you. Um, we under, I'm sure, understand that concern. Um, Commissioner, do you want to keep walking us through this? Sure. sure. So as we indicated, um, uh, you, you know, the, on July 1st, the original cohort would need to reapply. Uh, but then moving on, during the pandemic, the State Emergency Operations Command coordinated a, the mass feeding program where we're um, delivering meals to all the occupants in hotels. That's being funded by FEMA money. Um, that program um, will wind down um, at the beginning of July. Uh, we recognize that um, food insecurity will still be an issue for some of the guests in the hotel, um, but with the um, you know other uh, avenues opening up and um, and other support systems opening back up, that there will be. Um, some opportunity for people to get meals in other ways. Um, also, many hotels do not allow like microwaves or toaster ovens or other heating appliances in the motel rooms. And so, um, you know, we, we recognize that, but we will work with motels to see for those that don't have a centralized area um, in a common area that has some ability to prepare food, we're gonna see if we could get them to install something for the hotels we're still using. Um, but that, that meal system is planned to wind down um, in July. What does wind down mean end? Yes, yes. July 1st? In, in early July, we don't know the exact timing. Uh, we're recognizing they'll be provided in July. We're not sure if it's the first or the timing of that, but some of that's tied to FEMA funding and whatnot and the State Oper Emergency Operations Command um, who's been coordinating much of that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Um, and then, um, as we indicated, um, we do um, plan to um, have the adverse weather conditions policy in place in the winter. Very similar. We don't expect to make any changes to what it's historically been. Um, and, you know, and that's historically when we've run into motel capacity, particularly during the ski season, um, which um, we anticipate will happen this year as well. Um, and we anticipate as we've done in prior years, working with community providers to stand up extreme cold weather shelters on those um, particularly holiday weekends when room, you know, like President's Day or Martin Luther King weekend tend to be for some reason very cold and very popular for skiing and we run out of capacity. And that's when we've worked with providers to, to open up these emergency shelters that we pop up just to make sure we can meet the need. And we, and we envision that happening as well. Um, um, and as we indicated, we do plan on providing financial supports to people as they no longer become eligible in this program and, and will be transitioning out. Um, you know, our um, $3 million of essential payments, um, if we um, provided that um, to every household um, 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 that, that we're housing now, it would equal about a $1,500 payment per household. But you know, it, you know, it depends on how many will be eligible for that payment. I think this is a piece that the work group is still working on how this will be structured. I know our, you know, we've all I think agreed that we want to provide some sort of um, financial literacy um, uh, information to households before they transition out and are receiving these funds, just to make sure that you know they they know how to manage a lump sum of money like this and that we can assist them opening a bank account because some do not have bank accounts. And so that we wanna you know, provide some sort of level of financial support to households um, as they transition out as well in this area. And so those are the details we're still working out. And I would point out that you know, 
This is just the start of the work group in, in developing this plan. Um, we will need to promulgate rules to implement this, this point, this emergency housing plan, and that's the work of the work group moving forward right now. Also, um, there's some other um, policy issues the group is working to tackle as well um, in terms of, of the motel program and, and um, providing supports. Um, uh, one of those areas um, is enhancing uh, mental health services to people that were housing in motels and how do we continue to expand um, what we've tried to establish during the pandemic because we're serving a lot of households struggling with mental health issues and we want to make sure that we're uh, connecting folks and providing services to folks. And so there's some areas that the work group needs to, that wants to continue working on. And then also uh, the work group will also work through the summer and meet on what 23 will look like. And we would um, issue a proposal to, to the legislature in, in early November, around November 1st, to give members time to review it and digest it um, in anticipation of next year's session, legislative session. Okay, um, so th this is a very important part of the proposal. I, I think before I dive in with some of my questions, um, I see Rep. Jessup has hand up, but I, I think I'd like to get to to the end and see the budget. We've been, I, I, it's hard to sit and listen for a long time, so. Let's Rep. Jessup take your question, and then Commissioner, if you'll just get us to the end of the document, I think sure. then then we'll come back for other questions. No, I can wait, Madam Chair. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I think I would go back to to the budget chart included in that, and just kind of walk through some other pieces included there. And I know we can come back and delve into that. Um, as Representative Jessup indicated before, I think we, in prior pandemic years, we spent about 6 million GF on average on motels a year in addition to the community investments um, that were made through the Office of Economic Opportunity. Um, this plan anticipates spending um, just under 30 million on motels. So still about a, a program five times bigger than it historically has been, but smaller than what has been operating um, 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 during the pandemic. Um, we're proposing using three sources of federal funding um, for those costs. Uh, first, we would continue to draw down FEMA until we're no longer eligible and we're out of the state of emergency. Also, um, we're proposing using um, emergency rental assistance payments from the first ERAP um, stimulus package and then also from the second ERAP stimulus package. Um, I will point out um, uh, that using the ERAP funds do come with some limitations um, in terms of um, how we use those funds and how um, we need to provide documentation to support our, our use of funds this way for the federal government. Um, and as you'll see, and I don't mean to jump around the chart, but um, those requirements will be ex extensive. And so we're proposing 17 new limited service positions um, in DCF to help support this plan moving forward. Um, I would point out that we created 20 temp positions in ESD to administer the eligibility of the GA program during the pandemic because we just simply weren't staffed for a program that grew times 10 during the pandemic. And so we used FEMA money to pay for 20 temp positions, but those have our limitations of how, how many hours they can work in a year. And so we're proposing one to help with hiring and retention to move those from temp positions to limited service positions. And so that's 16 of the positions here. Um, and then also uh, given the financial reporting requirements of using the ERAP funds and some of the FEMA funds, one of those positions will be for our business office as well. And so th that we're proposing using um, ERAP admin of just about two and a quarter million dollars to fund those positions next year to do this work. Um, just given the substantial requirements, we're also um, looking to leverage um, uh, 4 million of the ERAP funds um, for motel based services, you know, case management, and that would be on top of those other funds that we um, provide through the housing opportunity program. So these would be on top of that. Um, also, um, we're looking to continue 
in the motels where we'll have large numbers providing um, on-site security as we've done um, during the pandemic. And uh, we, we have some leftover CRF money, as I indicated before, and we would use that for security. Um, and then we talked about the 4 million in CRF for um, support payments to transition folks out. Um, the other we're um, in uh, 211 handles are after hours emergency housing calls and placements. Um, and th they've certainly um, experienced an uptick in calls. Um, and so, uh, you know, to help cover that, we um, need an appropriation of, of a quarter million dollars to cover their costs for next year above and beyond their base contract. And we are proposing to use CRF funds that we still have available to do that as well. And so when you, outside of the base money that we're moving to OEO from the ESD, GA, the GF, um, we're proposing um, using uh, just under $41 million um, to support this housing plan of various federal funding sources. Thank you. Um, Representative Shai. Thanks. Um, and thanks for this presentation, all of you. I appreciate it um, and all the hard work you've done. I'm curious about the 17 positions and two and a quarter million dollars. I just did divided one by the other and came up with a little over $132,000 each. What am I missing? Is that really what it's going to cost per person for a year? Uh, when you um, average out um, their pay grade, so what they receive in compensation, and then given their limited service, they come with benefits. And so when you add in the cost of those benefits, they do, and then uh, some office space and equipment and other costs, they do approach that price point. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner, a, a concern that, that I have, so one, again, compliments to the working group, really hard, significant work that you've done. I, I think you've made tremendous progress over where we were. So kudos and thank you. Um, a, a concern that I have is um, both, I guess it's twofold. So for, Folks who are continuing to be housed through these programs, um, I, I am concerned that they have sufficient services placed around them so that they will be able to successfully move on to the next, the next part of their lives. I am not at all equating um, not having a home with um, mental health challenges or substance use disorders or um, a variety of other issues. But I think it's also fair to say that um, a portion of the population is unhoused because of those sorts of challenges. I don't see us putting can, can you describe what services we are putting around the population that needs them so that they don't, so that they will successfully move on or don't get unhoused because of their behaviors? Yeah, I think in terms of the unhoused due to their behavior, I think that was a lot. And Jessica, please jump in here. I think that was in recognizing um, that we, we are serving folks um, struggling with um, mental health and substance abuse challenges, which impact their behavior at times. And, and many of those fall into that minor category and, and recognizing not imposing a period of ineligibility was recognizing that we don't wanna penalize people um, you know, who are struggling with those, those you know, substance abuse or mental health issues. Um, also through the pandemic, we have, we have really um, worked to engage with our mental health. Um, Morning Fox was also um, the deputy commissioner for mental health um, was a part of this working group and we've met with him and the DAs um, throughout the pandemic trying to um, expand services um, to uh, folks who are housing in motels who are struggling um, with substance abuse and mental health issues. Um, we've been successful in some areas of the state of, of connecting those services to people in the motels. Um, one of the areas uh, of concern for us that we're seeing uh, with many of our providers in many different areas as well, 
are their inability to hire and retain staff right now. And that's impacting their ability to deliver services, whether um, it's mental health, substance abuse, case management, housing, navigation, um, you name it, our providers are struggling to retain staff. And um, I just got didn't know if you wanted to jump in here as well. Yeah, I mean, I think we haven't in the work group fully had the opportunity to dig into what this $4 million of services is going to get us because we've been so focused on trying to figure out those eligibility rules. I mean, my dream, honestly, and I don't know if $4 million is going to get us there, would be at the motels where we have, you know, 100 plus households that um, we could have sort of wraparound services, you know, just a not necessarily a case manager filling out housing applications, but just someone there to sort of mind the store, make sure everybody gets along, make sure their basic needs are met 24 seven, as opposed to just during the day, which we do have in some motels, but not all of them. I think a lot of the calls to police happen after hours. One of the tricky things though that Sean identified is some people do have a higher level of needs, specifically, um, you know, not just a uh, sort of case manager on site, but more of an MSW level person who's got the specific skills to work with people who are experiencing a not quite mental health crisis because we want to catch people before they're in crisis, um, but people with some challenging, you know, mental health disability related behaviors and with active substance use disorder and folks in recovery. And I know there are some interesting models that are being explored around the state, like um, in Chinden County, uh, there's a partnership, I think it's funded with ADAP dollars, um, with Turning Point that's happening where there are substance use disorder recovery coaches who are often people with lived experience themselves um, who are providing services to folks. So there's a lot of different needs that people have. You know, some folks might just need help filling out some applications and figuring out how to talk to landlords about the BRAP rental assistance program, or the other folks have a higher level of needs and it's really tricky to do it all. I, I might add on, if I may, that uh, a couple of things. One is that um, there are certainly communities around the state where there are more services embedded on site in motels, and that has proven to be a really, uh, a really helpful uh, and really important piece. There are other communities where uh, we don't have that, you know, where it has been a struggle to get community providers um, to engage in that same way. And then we have in between. Um, I think I would just echo also what Jessica said about individual situations are individual. Um, I think that it's it's really important to come at the services conversation with a not with not a one size fits all approach, right? Um, and I appreciate your your point, Madam Chair, that um, people uh, that there are lots of factors that go into somebody's life situation, which may include trauma or um, substance use or mental health issues. Uh, that it's not people are not homeless, right? That that is those sorts of the support and services go toward a lot of underlying things or convergent things. And then the final thing I might offer um, in this context is um, just respectfully reminding the committee that pre-pandemic we didn't have services in this way connected to the GA motel voucher program. That was a motel voucher for a set duration of grant with the hope um, and, and, and just some effort, but, but largely I hope people would be connected to things. And we've worked really hard with community partners over the years to shift that dynamic. And I think we've done that dramatically more so during the pandemic. And that's part of the thought of what is, uh, what does the GA motel voucher program, what is emergency housing, what is the, the program of last resort in the state look like going forward, right? This is, uh, FY22 is a transition year. You know, we need to be thinking forward about, you know, what are we doing now that sets that up for success? What are we doing intentionally now that is sustainable over the long term? And I think that becomes a part of that conversation, which also ties back into that point earlier um, regarding ARPA and the, the, the housing that we, right now, you know, there are, we talk about three legs of the stool. I'm sure you've heard this many, many times, right? And that's a real, we cannot forget that, right? We cannot lose sight of that at this moment in time. That we need rental assistance, which we have more of now than we've ever had. Services, which we've had more of now than we've ever had. And um, housing stock. Well, we, we, we need units, right? And I think that when we think about that all together, 
that's, it's really important to remember it's part of a system. Thank you, Mr. Peppinger, and um, I, I appreciate that we are in a vastly improved place over where we were before. And, you know, so it, I'm thinking of what we should aspire to be doing rather than how do we return to where we were um, in wanting this to be successful. Um, I, I know you, you all also have to, as we do, think about you know, how are we gonna pay for this uh, after the money goes away? And, and that's a huge challenge too. But let's, we, we, we need, we will continue to work on sorting that. Um, I, I really am concerned that we put a sufficient amount of the, the sorts of services around people in a way that works for them. And the, I, I'm not sure we're there. And I appreciate that y'all haven't had the opportunity to dig in on this, but um, I, I need to know more and to make sure that we're properly uh, funding what needs to be done. And we have a two to three week period to accomplish that. So I think this is going to be, I'm just looking at our budget horizon. Um, so th this is an area I wanna dig in on more. Um, and, and also think about how to use other partners in this process. So we talked about, and boy, we get it, the limitations of the mental health services or the ability to provide some of that around the state. I think everybody in our room knows about that. We've talked about it a lot. I wonder about using the CAPS as more of a resource in terms of guide. And I, I believe that you are, I, I, I think some of them are, are housing providers and are thinking about issues of financial literacy and those sorts of things. But I'm curious if there's an opportunity to use them as kind of the navigators in this process. Um, but I, I don't want to try to design a program here, but I'm, I'm just saying I think we need to do more um, or flesh this out more. Um, I, we've got a couple of committee member hands up. Um, Representative Harrison. Yeah, thank you. Um, Commissioner, did I understand you uh, uh, before saying that the Senate put your full proposal or part of your proposal in the uh, budget that they're advancing? So our understanding based on following the committee conversation, some of the like the web reports and other information haven't been posted yet, but our understanding is, is they've essentially taken the housing plan and the proposed legislation that we submitted to implement it um, in, into their, their, their version of the budget that came out, that's coming out of Senate, the Senate Appropriations Committee. Um, okay, and what would happen if that all went away and we couldn't reach agreement and the language was not put in there. What would happen to the budget next year? Well, um, at a base level, you know, the legislature gave us a uh, continuing authority to waive um, and vary our programs in response to the pandemic. So for the short time, we would have the ability to continue to do things differently. However, we wouldn't have, um, much of the funding available outside of the budget to support the spending once the FEMA money this summer goes away. Because right now we're primarily, FEMA is paying um, all of, you know, now that they're paying 100%, they're covering all of the costs of the motel program right now for the most part, except okay. for the services. Okay, thank you. Uh, the last part, uh, uh, following up on the chair and what you just said, uh, Commissioner, what happens a year from now? Um, are there other federal funds that will be available or will we have to figure out a way to fund this if the program stays about the same through the general fund? Yeah, I, you know, at this point, you know, the working group has been tasked to meet and to put together a proposal of what 
um, the 23 program will look like. So that work still needs to happen. And so that would inform some of those budget conversations. Um, but we know the FEMA money um, is, is scheduled to go away once the state of emergency is over. Um, the ERAP programs, you know, um, have a 12 month limit for assistance for a household and that would include the cost of the motels. So whether we're paying it to keep someone in a motel or if they find a place and then they get rental assistance, that's limited to 12 months. We're still waiting for treasury guidance on the second um, e ERAP funding to see if, if it goes beyond the 12, 12 months or, or if it's just a combined. Um, so that will dictate how long we can use ERAP funds for as well. And so there's certainly, depending on the size of the scope of the program um, and, and the nature of the program and federal funding, there could be some base pressures here, but we just it's just too early to indicate what, what those would look like. Okay, thank you. Hey, Representative Harrison, we don't get to go home if there's not a budget. So there, there, there will be one, one way or another. And I'm, I'm counting uh, on I, us. I am home. <laughs> you don't get to get out of that chair unless there's a budget. Um, Representative Yacovani. Um, uh, thank you. And I just want to um, augment the chair's comments around the supported services that so many of these uh, families need. I don't want to be redundant. Um, I, I wonder if we know how many of the households with children have open cases with family services or some type of involvement. And if that's been escalating over the last year or if uh, just from the get-go they've had involvement and it's been sustained. And I, I mentioned that in part to see whether there's any federal 4E um, reimbursement opportunities to help um, augment what might be going on here. Second uh, concern, uh, not a concern, but just a question. Um, I shouldn't make an assumption, but the 17 staff, what I imagined when I heard you talk about the rental assistance program and uh, administering it in such a fashion to make sure there's eligible expenses was uh, um, more administrative work to assure compliance with the feds to make sure we can use the ERAP money that way. And less, I'll use the word service coordination, um, but, but less uh, direct services that people need. And finally, um, uh, I'm leading up to the need for uh, richer services, I think, or more, more substantial. I've often felt that when, and this is an assumption, so shame on me, but, I've often felt that when people manifest behaviors that are unacceptable to us, often that's the result of uh, untreated trauma, um, substance abuse, mental health. They're driven by some often with medical needs that I'm always hesitant to punish, but would rather treat those as I know you would too, if you could probably. Uh, so that makes me think when the chair said, community action, the CAPS. I thought of, um, could we, should we redirect some of the 2.25 million to our CAPS and try to get both done? Try to develop a relationship with the staff and at our community action and the array of services they provide for enduring relationships. And I may be naive, but could we still satisfy your administrative requirements around the rental assistance program may not cost 132,000 per FTE. Um, we may be able to buy more. And then I do worry, and you mentioned this, Sean, um, whether our mental health agencies can even staff up uh, for this. And I don't know how to crack that one. And finally, and this will sound convoluted, but I'm just trying to um, reach when, uh, when Jessica mentioned MSWs, um, I have been thinking about swapping uh, uh, ARPA dollars out with other general funds elsewhere in AHS to create general fund to do some Medicaid match on this to cover uh, medical social workers and, and uh, a level of services in combination with what's going on at the CAPS, et cetera, 
So it's a, it's a pretty substantive complement of support services. Those are just some thoughts. And, and I know you can't, um, there's so little time from June 1, which I guess my final, my, well, all of that, um, what would happen if you said, okay, uh, we need more time to set this up. It's not June 1, but July 1 or August 1. And we continue, you continue to use FEMA in the breach here. Is that a possibility? Do, are, you, are you accelerating the time frame? And that's not a criticism for financial reasons or programmatic reasons or both? I think it's um, there, there's a combination of factors driving the timing of our plan. One is just the capacity of the program in motel rooms and yep. what we're learning and needing to make sure we have a, a program that aligns with, with that as well. And then also with some of the reopening of the other services, allowing us to move people to other housing situations as well as we come out of the state of emergency. So it, it, there's a bunch of different factors playing together in terms of the timing of this plan. Um, it, you know, and the FEMA funding is there, but then we'll be able to transition to ERAP. Um, but then, you know, if we start using ERAP sooner, uh, you know, depending on, on the timing, then that could impact the 12 months for households. And so there are a lot of moving pieces here that we would need to, be, need to step back and analyze if we change from this plan. Um, a lot of work went into this plan and, 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 and the financing of it and understanding those, the interplay there. Um, and so we would need to be very thoughtful if we start, you know, uh, plug and play different pieces of it because of, there's a lot of inner interplay of the different components of the plan and how they complement and support each other. And so the, the, that would be our concern there. Um, in terms of uh, the community action agencies, um, we've been able to dip some other funding sources that have come to OEO and other federal funds to um, provide enhanced funding and, and um, for them to, for positions. Uh, many of our partners that we work with and some of this 4 million would go to them as well because many of our caps are like, um, what's really been a model in the state during the pandemic um, is the work that CBOEO has done up at the Holiday Inn in South Burlington where they are mm -hmm. essentially doing what Groundworks is doing in Brattleboro where they've essentially taken over the hotel and have staff there 24 seven um, coordinating services for the hundreds of guests, you know, over hundred guests that are staying there. Um, that's really been a, a great model for us to look to what's happening in Brattleboro mm -hmm. and Burlington. Unfortunately, that's one of the facilities we're losing early um, is, you know, um, is there, they want to take it back and renovate and reopen for, for business. Um, we were fortunate to be able to master lease it during the pandemic, but, but that's coming to a close in June and, um, and that's unfortunate. Yeah. Thank you, Sean. If I may add on to what Commissioner said, I think that's a really important point that circles back to something that he said very early on this afternoon around the capacity of motels, right? Because regardless of uh, how much money we have available, um, the at some point we are going to run out of that capacity. To, we, we could have all the money to place people in motels that, that we want, but if we don't literally have those motel rooms, and, the, and I'll, I'll remind you that, that 650 that we are projecting will be at in October is still double what we have historically had in the deep of winter. And those are times when we would run out of motel capacity in various communities around the state and just hope that not one more person needs <laughs> You know, shelter on a really cold night. So I think that that's, that's another parameter that's outside of the money conversation and outside of the, the resources conversation. Yeah, thank you. And I, I'd like to come back to that uh, before we adjourn here today, but let me, Rep Fagan's had his hand up for a while. Thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> Commissioner, I wanna, I wanna, Kind of put together the two conversations the one that you had this morning um uh, hard conversations not been asked yet but uh, uh the one you had this morning with the with the rutland delegation and then the one that you've had here and so this morning on the rutland delegation you were asked by someone 
um, about precluding individuals from other states coming here to be able to access this program. And, and as you said, we cannot do that. That is not constitutionally uh, capable of being done. Um, you told us today that uh, as far as surrounding states, we are, we're the best of all the states in the area as far as housing people that are homeless. So if we continue to have that type of, of, of availability for folks that are homeless um, in the greater Northeast area, uh, once we begin to actually house people in, in permanent housing and get them out of the, the, uh, the hotels, what is to preclude other people from just coming into the state because, hey, go to Vermont and they'll give you a hotel room for, four, for 84 days. Um, and we don't solve anything. We actually just make the problem worse. That's my question. Sure. So just to put context, and I think I answered it in the Senate and, and I'll kind of answer it the same way. Um, I would say that 90% of the households that we're housing in the program today were in Vermont at the start of the pandemic. And 10% came to Vermont during the pandemic. Of that, I 10%, I would say half had some connection to Vermont that brought them back, whether it was a, a, they'd been away for a long time or they had family or friends, but that's what brought them here. And then um, just as we've seen with the housing market and people moving into the state who are more affluent and buying up all, all of the homes, um, you know, some people came here because of our pandemic response. And I would say that would make up the other half of that 10%. So in terms of numbers, it's not a significant number, but we've always had people leaving the state and coming into the state. And we see it in all of our benefit programs, to be honest with you. Um, you know, the Supreme Court's been very clear and Jessica's the expert in this area and I would defer to her, but everyone has a right to travel, even folks of a lower income. And so, um, you know, just as we have people leaving because of the high cost of living here, some people move in because of the quality of life here, whether you're high income or low income. And so that I think that's something Vermont's always seen and, and will continue to see moving forward um, um, in, you know, in, in its population. Okay. Thank you. Um, the other question that I had is, are we overpaying for hotel rooms based upon what they would go for on the open market? Um, we traditionally um, have been able to negotiate lower lower rates um, because we provide a, a, a bulk set of business for them and that they can count on. And so, um, you know, at the start of the pandemic, we were um, on average $88 a night, but as hotels have started opening, their rates have started to creep up a little bit. I think we're now at around 97. Many of those hotel rooms might have gone in the low 120s, 130 before the pandemic. So I think, you know, on average, but I think it, and some of that seasonal, like in, in the fall, we our rights, the rates we pay might spike due to um, homecoming with the colleges and, and leaf peeping season. We see a similar thing during the height of the ski season where it's demand sometimes drive the rates and that we get our best deal during the off season. I think during the pandemic, we've been able to um, enjoy, some, keep the rates at a relatively stable, but they're starting to fluctuate up a little bit right now. And the reason why I ask is that uh, if you go online today and try to book the Quality Inn in July, which is open right now for, for booking, it's $85 a night. And I think we're paying them, what, 90 right now, mud season? Yeah, the, uh, one thing I would caveat on that is that the state of Vermont does not pay damages. And so sometimes they add on a little bit to the room rate. Okay. So like if you come at, as a private, you give them a credit card number. And if you damage the room, they charge your card. The state of Vermont does not pay for damages. And so sometimes they increase our rates a little bit. I'm learning things all the time, which is a good thing. <laughs> so thank you very much. Um, so the, the other portion of this plan that I think that we should touch upon is, um, the assumption or the, the, the attempt to build uh, enough beds to take, oh, take the pressure off of the hotels. And we, we, you've been clear and I think we all totally understand uh, the challenges of having sufficient beds. I, I, I certainly remember the conversations in here in the past when, when we supported um, some emergency shelters because there were not sufficient beds. Um, 
the the fear that some th that is there is that this aggressive plan to build more space is um, is not going to work. I mean, just the likelihood of. I mean, I was so impressed with what we were able with everything you all have done, but that also includes the um, number of housing units that were stood up over the past year. And I, I it, we're talking now about standing up even more in this year. Um, I, I, I don't know what to say other than, you know, what, what are we going to do if that doesn't work? And I, that's not a fair question, but it's certainly on my mind. And it's certainly on our mind as well. And I think that's the planning that's still going to go on on our end and with the work group is uh, contingency planning on how do we continue to meet um, a growing need with a decreased motel capacity and then also you know the timing of new units and how many come online I think we're going to have to get creative like in the winter it'll be emergencies to pop up shelters I think we're still in our work trying to explore and be as creative as we can just as we were in the pandemic I think it's mm -hmm. I think it's critical that we continue uh, thinking in that way that even though the pandemic's over we still need to be thinking in a pandemic mindset of like how can we meet this challenge like just as we did in the pandemic that it's it, you know uh, while, while the virus might be ab abating a bit, we might be in a better spot. We still have these immense social challenges and conditions that we need to address. And how do we do that? And what, how can we do that? And how can we partner with our, you know, all of our community agencies that do this work to support them and us as well and bring ideas to the table? You know, um, whether we're getting all the procuring all these little tiny houses or something and putting them in, you know, I think those are the things we need to we're, we're thinking about how do we meet that need. Yeah, no, mm -hmm. I, I, I understand that and I it, it's. It's mind boggling what we have to yet accomplish. Um, and I just it, the notion that we're going back to the way it was just we cannot think that way and i think if if anything the pandemic has exposed how vulnerable we are um to these sorts of challenges but then throw on you know the huge distress that the pandemic has created and we're just years uh, away from recovering as a society from this, it seems to me. Uh, and yeah, it's it's not how do, how do we solve it in FY22 and, and then we continue on. It's, it's a 10 year problem, I think. Um, Rep Jessup, then Fagan. Yeah, I, I don't wanna repeat what you say. I agree with everything you've just said, Madam Chair. And I think um, the way that I'm looking at it is trying to get at issues upstream because despite all the wonderful work, despite the federal resources, the clock will keep ticking. And, and I think in terms of mental health, I think the pandemic has not only shown it in the GA program, look what's going on in the school budgets, look what's going on with kids. I mean, you can point to any number of systems across the state. So the, the focus on some of those supportive systems, which has already been said, is a place that I personally would like to put some energy. And you know, maybe it's things like, uh, what are we doing with renegotiation? And this is an idea that I've heard um, others express so it, with the 1115 waiver. Can there be some creative thinking with those investments, um, et cetera? Yeah, okay. Thank you. Rep Fagan. Thank you. So, Commissioner, this morning we had VHCB on and I talked about um, um, breaking down uh, barriers between different organizations. Um, and, and he said that there, he is, he's got parts of working groups and I know that part of AHS was working with them and it didn't dawn on me at the time, but certainly it does when we're talking about emergency housing, um, the ability to work um, you know, across, across agency, et cetera, uh, early in the process such that if there needs to be a, a temporary uh, temporary workaround to, and I'll use Act 250 as an example, in order to get shovels in the ground early, quicker, 
Um, someone mentioned this morning, he did, he mentioned the old college of St. Joseph, the provider, or no, was it C? Uh, yes. And um, um, in order to get a shovel in the ground in an Act 250 permit process, you're looking at a year. And, and that puts us a year further, closer to not being able to use those funds. So, so just the point that I wanted to make um, as part of, of working groups that are, that are doing work to build something, build infrastructure that the state of Vermont sorely needs, it also needs to look at, are there any regulatory burdens that need to be overcome on a temporary basis in order to get this done? I think you make a, a great point, Representative Fagan, and I believe in the governor's proposal of, of, of his ARPA allocation for the, some of the different projects and the transformative investments he wants to make is he touches on that where some of these projects that you know we don't want to delay and jeopardize the funding, that, that there'd be some sort of um, uh, exception process for some of the permitting if they're built in certain ways and in certain areas of communities that we want to encourage growth. And I think those are the things um, you know, that we would support just knowing the timing is urgent here for some of these investments. I appreciate that because it's not just, you know, running out of time to spend those funds, but the longer that, that it, you take to spend those funds, the longer people are going to be living in hotels and other situations where we would prefer not to have them. So thank you. So um, that, that's this, that is an interesting note to end on. I was this conversation um, lies clearly in the jurisdiction of appropriations, but it also belongs to the Housing and General Affairs Committee, the Human Services Committee, and I would suggest also the Healthcare Committee. Um, Rep Fagan, if you want to do permit reform, then we also need to talk to um, the Natural Resources Committee, and we may not want to make this too big of a problem. Um, but committee, we we will certainly continue to have a conversation. But I am, um, I the. I, I know that the folks from DCF have testified in a couple of other committees and we need to think about how to draw these conversations together given our collaborative approach to developing the budget. Um, and we're going to be doing that over the next uh, few days, figuring out how to have a productive conversation because in fact, we do just have two to three weeks to figure out where we're landing for the time, be time being and how to set ourselves up for the future uh, or for the next six months until we're back here. Um, a, a while ago, Ms. Radford, you had raised your hand um, and I, I let, me, let me just offer you a chance for a, a few concluding remarks. Um, and, and I'll turn to others for that too. I just wanted to answer a couple of questions that came up that I thought I might be able to add something in on. So under ARPA in the statute, even though we don't have guidance from treasury yet, you can actually go up to 18 months. I do get nervous because if someone's gonna try to lease up with a private landlord, boy, they wanna see at least 12 months of rental assistance given that people are unlikely to increase their income enough to cover their rent on their own. Um, for FEMA, uh, my understanding is that under the Stafford Act, right, so long as we have our state of emergency and FEMA looking over our shoulder thinks non-congregate shelter is still required, they'll still reimburse at the 100% cost share, but we don't actually know when all of that's going to end at this point. Um, so far as family services involvement goes, um, I've heard Erin Olican, who's the head of the Reach Up program, say that I think there are 200 Reach Up families that were in um, the motels out of I mean, that's, all, that's like more than 80%. Um, I'm not sure how many of them had FSD involvement. I can tell you that for one of my clients, um, Wendy Morgan presented information on her story in House General. Um, her, she's a person with a disability and was receiving services from a chronic care initiative nurse. Um, her son also has a disability and was having a really, really hard time. And there was family, family services involvement. She was in a motel for about five months. As soon as she got into her permanent apartment, permanently affordable apartment, mind you, uh, all of it kind of melted away, right? Like she's so much better able to manage her disability and her son is doing way, way better. Uh, and so I think some of those service needs, 
they don't necessarily totally go away, but they, they really get minimized when people get into a stable place. So creating those stable places is so important. And I think um, someone else might've covered it. I just wanted to flag. So the services in here are separate from the service dollars that are funded through the Office of Economic Opportunity, which go to a lot of the housing case managers who help people find apartments. I, it's my understanding that these service dollars are more for the wraparound services in the motels uh, to make sure that the people there are but I could be a little bit wrong on that. But there is, there are other funding streams. There are definitely some gaps though that we need to fill in. Just wanted to add those things. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for your work on this. Um, Commissioner, I turn it back to you if you want to have any concluding sure, remarks. Uh, thank you. Uh, I really appreciate uh, the time with the committee today and your questions. Um, always very thoughtful. Um, uh, and I also, you know, as we, as you indicated, there's several weeks to go of the Senate and the House working through their different versions of the budget, and this will be one piece of it in conference committee. Um, you know, and we, um, you know, moved forward with this working group, and I thought did some really good work and, and came up with a, a good proposal. Um, we just want to make sure um, as the negotiations get more intense between the House and the Senate and conference committee, um, that we try to honor the work and the commitments we've made between the administration and our partners in that working group as we, as, as the proposal gets fleshed out by the legislature and to make sure that we're communicating and aligned, um, just given that we work really hard over a series of eight meetings to come to a consensus and, 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 um, and it's a, and it's a proposal that we put together that we all agree on that, um, we make sure that we have the time and the opportunity, and I know things get very intense and quick, but that we um, wanted to the best of our ability to honor that work and that working group moving forward as we try to finalize, uh, you know, what 22 looks like, um, uh, you know, with the legislature and the working group and then um, the work throughout the summer. Yeah, thank, thank you. That, that was very nicely done, Commissioner, as somebody who's participating in, in working groups, it is important to honor the process. Um, I don't think, and, and we certainly will need to, um, we, we will all continue working together on this. It's a, it's a group effort. Um, and uh, we don't have several weeks. And in fact, if we're going to have a gang of people working on this, I think we have more on the order of two plus weeks. So there's not a lot of time. I'm, I'm, we're getting to the end. Um, committee members, I don't see any other questions from you. Thank you very much for um, a, a long, intense conversation. Um, we, uh, I'm, I'm going to let you go. We're, we're scheduled for an informational meeting at nine o'clock in the morning. Um, Commissioner, before I say goodbye to you, I had a question that I, I just wanted to ask, but I just, so I think we're done with our hearing this afternoon um, and committee will meet again at nine o'clock tomorrow morning. Uh, and